We have one more panel today. Now that everybody's settled back, welcome back. Um, it's my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce to you today our keynote speaker, Senator, Senator Charles Cobb, Robb. Um, Senator Robb uh, was a United States Marine Corps veteran and honor graduate of Quantico. He went on to serve two tours uh, of duty in Vietnam where he commanded a rifle company in combat and was awarded the Bronze Star. Senator Robb um, later served as Democratic member of the U.S. Senate uh, from 1989 until 2001. During his tenure, he became the only member of Congress ever to serve on all three national security committee, committees, intelligence, armed services, and foreign relations at the same time. Um, in February 2004, Senator Robb was appointed co-chair of the Iraq Intelligence Commission, an independent panel tasked with investigating U.S. intelligence surrounding the U.S. 2003 invasion of Iraq and Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. Um, in 2006, he was appointed to serve on the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board. And there's so much more I can talk to you about, uh, Senator Robb, but I would like to Turn, um, turn the podium back to him, knowing that he will give you a very nice introduction of our pa second panel today. And thank you. Uh, when I, maybe I should begin by saying uh, Monday noon, I, I was not planning to be here today. I had another engagement at this particular moment. Uh, two, and I, I got an a uh, email late in the uh, afternoon saying, would you come and substitute for John Hamry? Now, no one can substitute for John Hamry. Uh, in fact, let me put in a quick uh, boost for his two-pager. If there's anybody here that is not on his mailing list, it came out yesterday, and uh, I mean, it comes out every uh, week, uh, the one yesterday, he, ha he handled all of the the possibilities uh, and permutations and ramifications of, of war in cyberspace in two pages. And he does that c constantly uh, on some thoughtful topic. So if you're not signed up for it, I don't know who to uh, apply to here, but I, I know that he likes to get wide distribution on that. Uh, but I'm, I was asked if I would come and introduce the panel. And I said, well, sure, I'd be happy to. I've got to change a couple of things. Uh, and then I checked and I said, well, let's not really introduce the panel uh, specifically. I said, we've got somebody else for that. And I said, well, do you want to be introduced? I said, I shouldn't be introduced. And I, I, I do appreciate the kind introduction. Uh, but and you're, I can assure you that I'm not giving a keynote speech. Uh, as I say, until last night, I didn't know precisely what my role might be in today's program. So it will be mercifully brief. Uh, I will start by thanking uh, Anna and the uh, Diplomatic Courier and the, uh, uh, our Italian counterparts for arranging for this meeting, which will be informative. Uh, I caught just the end of the nonproliferation panel. Uh, if I were going to participate substantively in a discussion, that would have been the one, because I'm, I, I do spend some time in national security, including nonproliferation matters. Uh, I do not spend time uh, thinking substantively about some of the economic challenges that are going to be discussed by some real experts uh, in just a couple of minutes. Uh, let me uh, begin by s simply observing that the uh, nuclear proliferation itself has enormous economic impact, or, or could have, depending upon what happens. We won't go into detail. Uh, in fact, they didn't get in the little piece of what I saw uh, at the end of the last panel didn't get into significant detail in, in some of those areas, but uh, the, uh, the ramifications of, of what could happen, uh, depending upon particularly what happens with, uh, uh, in North Korea and Iran right now, and the, the counteractions that might be taken uh, could indeed have very significant uh, co uh, uh, consequences that would flow from it. Uh, with it would, if, if we went in, in that particular direction, or if, if the uh, evolution was in that particular direction, obviously uh, 
Uh, you're going to have the prospect of an arms race that has uh, enormous implications if you even look at the Cold War and see how much the former Soviet Union spent in anticipation of some of the things that we might have and basically uh, bankrupted the country in the process. Uh, you'd cost uh, the uh, amount of money that we spend on providing for the nuclear umbrella that is a part of that and or the extension of it and or request to put it in writing as the Japanese Prime Minister has asked us to do. All of those have e economic consequences that uh, are, are, are worth considering. Uh, the refugee status that uh, occurs when some of these actions are taking place, uh, not often uh, mentioned uh, in terms of the thing, the number of times that it should be, but the, the cost uh, with respect to refugees uh, from Iraq uh, over a period of time, we're now experiencing in uh, uh, Pakistan as well as uh, Afghanistan. We have them in Darfur. Uh, North Korea, yesterday uh, Paul Wolfowitz did a piece in the Wall Street Journal that some of you may have seen uh, on this particular topic, but there are significant uh, consequences. We are fortunate to have a panel uh, to help us explore how the economic crisis that we're experiencing on a global basis, and if anybody is still of the belief that we don't have true globalization, uh, if you get up every morning and don't figure out what the markets in those who are just ahead of you have done that day and anticipate what it's going to do to your own markets, uh, I would submit that would be uh, sufficient proof for that particular question. Uh, you don't have to agree with uh, Tom Friedman that the world is flat to recognize that uh, there is a significant impact that uh, we have enjoyed from it. There are obviously some uh, initial signs that we might be at the start of an economic recovery, but most top economists and the IMF experts remind us that we still face incredible challenges uh, in that area. Unemployment in the United States, there were some figures that were released earlier today and around the world, uh, continues to rise even if the uh, recovery starts, the economic uh, uh, effects of unemployment are going to continue for some period of time. and. Uh, may take uh, a very different path and we may have a very different situation to look at it. Uh, the world that emerges from this crisis uh, is likely to look very different from the world that uh, preceded the crisis uh, and it's going to have huge ramifications for the United States, uh, for all of the G8 countries including our host country uh, Italy uh, and it's going to have ramifications for uh, China, the other G5 invitees, all of the other invitees that uh, have been invited to the, uh, the summit coming up in a couple of weeks. It raises challenging questions uh, about how international efforts and institutions such as the G8 and the IMF will function in this new world and the next global economy. Uh, President Obama's proposal, which he's formally rolling out uh, this morning, I think it is, uh, been written about in the last couple of days. Uh, for revamping the federal regulation of the nation's financial markets and efforts to develop new rules to stop the phenomenon of excessive securitization of the financial system and the use of derivatives that led to the current financial crisis could result in the broadest rewrite of financial regulation since the aftermath of the Great Depression. Uh, that clearly would reshuffle uh, responsibilities with consumers, regulators, creating new protections for uh, giant financial players that haven't really been involved before, they've been off the radar, like hedge funds, private equity companies under direct federal supervision. So those are just some of the challenges. Forgive me for not giving you a, quote, keynote address uh, in terms of this topic. Uh, this is not uh, an area of, uh, this is not my forte, as I explained to the panel a few minutes ago, but I'm here to learn, as, as you are, and to have an opportunity to interact with those who do uh, know something about it. I'm going to turn it over for the specific introduction uh, to uh, where, oh, okay. Uh, Steve, uh, Stephen Schrange is uh, the uh, CSIS uh, Scholl Chair on International Business. He is a former uh, White House and USTR official. He's got expertise on the Hill and is co-chair of the G8's uh, anti-crime and terrorism group. Uh, 
for individual uh, introductions of the panel and to conduct the remainder of this particular session. So I'm delighted to be able to be with you to join in learning uh, more about the preparations for the G8 summit, uh, that uh, the formalization which will take place in a couple of weeks. But Stephen, at this point, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Senator Rob. It's an honor to have you here today. And, and I think you're far too modest with your wide range of experience that I think crosses so many different areas. And I know Dr. Hamry very much wanted to be here today. Unfortunately, he was called in to uh, a meeting with the South Korean president for lunch at Blair House, which is a, a hard thing to refuse, but we were so honored to be have someone of, of Senator Rob's stature that could come in and, and talk about such a wide array of issues. Um, and as he noted, we do face the worst global economic crisis since the Great Depression, and it's having wide-ranging impacts across the world, causing many to question core concepts of our economic systems and international institutions. And whether we're seeing primarily green shoots, as Fed Chairman Bren Bernanke said, or yellow weeds, as Nuro, as Nuro Robini, the prominent economist, said this week, I think it's undeniable that the crisis has shaken some leaders' key assumptions, launched efforts to rethink global structures, and raises a series of critical questions for the G8 and policymakers around the world. Some of these are obviously, what will the next global economy look like? What will replace growth driven by unsustainable U.S. consumption and export-driven economies that have thrived off of it? What strategic impacts are happening as economic problems influence or fuel security and foreign policy challenges around the world? What are the impacts as the crisis ramifications flow through both existing powers, such as the G8, and emerging powers, such as China, and the developing world? How will it reshape institutions such as the G8 and the IMF that are at the core of global economic efforts? And finally, and most importantly to this conference, as we look towards the summit in Italy, what priority actions must the G8 and other nations take to tackle these problems? And as we think through these problems, we really couldn't ask for a better panel or a more esteemed panel in terms of addressing these issues. Uh, first, Tim Adams, who is currently the managing director of the Lindsay Group and whom I've had the pleasure of working with in several capacities. His most recent government service was as the Undersecretary of the Treasury for International Affairs where he was the U.S. government's point person on all international financial issues, ranging from exchange rate policy, G7 meetings, IMF and World Bank issues, and, and based on this as an interaction with colleagues around the world, he's widely regarded and recognized by his key partners and counterparts in emerging markets such as China, India, and Brazil, and has traveled extensively through Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. Dr. Adams has served as the Chief of Staff to two Treasury Secretaries and an international economic official to two Presidents, and just when you thought his range and depth across different issues couldn't get any deeper, he also served as the top uh, policy advisor on both domestic and international policy for a successful presidential campaign. And beyond that, has direct private sector experience as an entrepreneur fine of the G7 group. So, Tim, as always, we look forward to your thoughts and proposals across this range of efforts. And next we have, we're joined by Dr. Nancy Birdsall, who's also broken new ground in many different capacities, including launching the renowned Center for Global Development, of which she's president. Um, she brings to these roles in this discussions a deep and impressive background, including serving as Executive Vice President of the Inter-American Development Bank, the largest of the regional development banks, 14 years of experience in research, policy, and management positions with the World Bank, including Director of Pol the Policy Research Department, and author, co-author, and editor of, of a dozen books and monographs and over 75 scholarly articles, serving on a number of prestigious boards, including the Overseas Development Council and a number of committees with the National Academy of Sciences. Overall, her insight and advice are widely sought out both nationally and internationally, including frequently by senior U.S. and foreign officials and by many members of Congress, as seen by our recent testimony, uh, ranging from Foreign Relations Committee to, to, to all, all over. So we look forward to her greatly valued and respected analysis today. And finally, last but not least, we're honored to have IMF Executive Director Arrigo Sadun with us today. Since the financial crisis, few, if any, organizations have been more at the center of efforts to confront the crisis and find new ways forward than the IMF. Executive Director Sadun will be able to give us a first-hand account of not only how the IMF views the current evolving situation, but how the IMF itself is evolving and how other international institutions have to evolve rapidly to address these new challenges. But he doesn't only have experience in these international institutions, but also in national governments, particularly the very national government that's going to be leading the G8 in this upcoming summit from his role at the uh, Italian Treasury, where he's Director of Economic and Financial Analysis Department, 
and he also has deep private sector experience, another entrepreneur. We've got uh, two, uh, three entrepreneurs in different ways here today as the founder of the Business Information Group in Milan. And again, as a widely published expert on international economics, um, we look forward to his thoughts. And he's also not a stranger to Washington, having come here earlier to do his PhD and master's work. So we welcome you back, both in your current capacity as the IMF and here to, to CSIS. We look forward to all your comments, and we could go on much more at length, but we really look forward to hearing their exact uh, thoughts on the ways moving forward and, uh, and to open it up to your questions and the many experts in the audience today. So thank you very much. So with that, I'd like to turn to Tim to kick off the discussion. Thank you, Stephen, for your, um, for your introduction and uh, a little bit of hyperbole involved in, uh, in the introduction, but I'll take it and haul you around other places I go. It's a pleasure to be back here at CSIS and also to share the stage with two noted uh, academics and policy experts uh, who I also uh, happen to call dear friends. So we rarely get to see each other in these kinds of circumstances, but it's, um, it's a pleasure and honor to be here with, uh, with two dear friends. Uh, extraordinary times, without question. Uh, and you've, been, you've asked me to kind of kick the discussion off today, talk a little bit about the strategic implications, uh, or at least those that are, are seen. Um, Joseph Schumpeter said that history is a collection of events, most of which were unintended, and I would argue most of which probably uh, uh, unpredicted and unforeseen. So as we look at the collection of things in our box that we're worried about and we can extrapolate certain trend lines, uh, probably the issues we'll be confronting five years from now will look very different than what we we're able to describe today. And the key is to have a policy apparatus which is flexible enough, malleable enough, and, and open enough to think about how this crisis uh, will morph itself into ways in which we haven't yet really began to fully appreciate. Uh, that said, let's, uh, let's take a crack at, at, at some of the issues which are quite obvious. And, and the most obvious, and I know Nancy will talk about this, is the world's a lot poorer today than it was 18 months ago. We've lost 50 trillion, at least $50 trillion worth of wealth equivalent to global GDP. Uh, some of that's housing, some of it's equity, some of it is uh, uh, changes in values of commodities. But as with most crises, those at the very bottom are always hurt the worst. The World Bank and other institutes, as, as Nancy's, have done a remarkable job of trying to quantify uh, that, uh, that setback to the world's poorest, the world's most vulnerable, and try to put a human face to it without question. Much of the progress that we had seen, a good portion of the progress we had seen during this recent expansion, the best five-year expansion in my lifetime, uh, has taken uh, a bit of a step back because of this crisis, and uh, that means that those who are vulnerable, most vulnerable, are more vulnerable than they were before on a human level, but also uh, at a state level. The fragile states that we all know too well, which, which compose the front page of the major uh, daily publications, Pakistan, Ukraine, Iran, other places, uh, their fragility is only exacerbated by the depth and breadth of this crisis, a crisis which we may be out of the crisis stage, but the recovery stage could be long and painful uh, with enormous uncertainties. So it is a world that is poorer and more fragile and more vulnerable than it was before. Uh, and it, it, it's also affected by the fact that the private capital flows that were so prevalent during this recent expansion, some one point. Uh, $3 trillion worth of private bank lending, at least to corporates in emerging markets that we saw in the 2005, 2000, 2006, 2007, that's, uh, that's, that's gone. You know, uh, Ross Perot back in the 90s talked about the great sucking sound. He was talking about jobs in Mexico, but in fact we have our own great sucking sound, and that is capital being sucked out of so many locations that uh, are starved of capital, of capital and which capital can be put to work in such a highly productive manner. And then I suspect that development budgets will come under stress and strain <clears throat> as uh, uh, over the coming um, quarters and, and years as we begin to dial back the stimulus, the fiscal stimulus uh, that is flooded the global economy and we'll be looking for savings. And unfortunately, the international budgets, the foreign assistance budgets are always an easy target. Uh, just look at the look at the debate that's occurred on Capitol just within the last 24 hours on funding for the IMF. It's an easy populist target to go after foreign assistance budgets, and I'm truly concerned about what uh, our foreign assistance budget will look like going forward. I know the president has committed to not only maintaining but increasing, and I hope that uh, I hope that we can that we can continue doing that. The second issue is 
<clears throat> this crisis probably accelerates this broad shift, which is written about so frequently over the last few years, of <clears throat> moving from a unipolar world to a multipolar world. <clears throat> and I note some of the headlines that from the, some of the papers over the last couple of months. The Sydney Sunday paper quotes the big broad headline, says, end of the U.S. era, now China calls the tune. Uh, <clears throat> President uh, Lula, Brazil President Lula, said this crisis was caused by the irrational behavior of white people with blue eyes, who before the crisis appeared to know everything and now demonstrate they know nothing. Uh, and then even our own friends of the Western club, uh, Mr. Sarkozy, says the all-powerful market is finished, and the good prime minister of the U.K., Gordon Brown, says the Washington consensus is dead. I, I, I disagree with that. I think it was incomplete, but I don't think it's necessarily dead. But you get, you, you get the drift. The fact is there has been a rush to, to declare the end of, of a Western-centered, U.S.-dominated, European-dominated era of economic theory and thinking and policy, I think that's premature. I think we still have lessons to learn. But nonetheless, there is calling into question. And there is the rise of the so-called uh, 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 Beijing consensus. And I was just in Beijing last week, and I heard it for the first time about the Himalayan consensus. So there are lots of new consensus, and, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not dismissing any of them. They all have certain unique factors, and we should certainly be more sensitive to something other than just top-line nominal economic growth by looking at environmental issues and, and the state of, of, of human development. But the fact is there is this view that the West has somehow stumbled, stumbled badly, maybe stumbled permanently, and this natural shift away from the West toward uh, the East, if you will, or toward developing markets. It, we certainly heard it from the BRICS, uh, uh, Brazil, India, Russia, and China meeting in Russia just over the last few days. There is a sense they play a, glo a greater uh, role on the global stage, and certainly they will, and they certainly will want uh, greater voice and influence, and that will be an issue I'm sure that uh, Dr. Sadoon will discuss when he talks about the IMF. Uh, the other issue is that cash is king because we're in a cash-starved world, and if you have reserves like the Chinese do of $2 trillion or other, uh, other Asian economies, uh, the Japanese, for example, or if you happen to be sitting on trillions of dollars worth of wealth as they do in the Gulf, that buys you enormous influence and power, especially as the West and especially the U.S. is increasingly dependent on imported capital. And if you look at our physical, tra physical trajectory, which is sobering and unsustainable, it gives you an indication of how increasingly dependent we're going to be on the rest of the world to fund uh, not only government, but, uh, but in increasing aspects of an expanding government. I think that certainly makes us more vulnerable to outside forces, uh, and we will have to find a way to grapple with uh, that vulnerability. Uh, the fourth issue is one in which uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about, and I know the G20 has tried to address it, and that is the issue of, of isolationism, protectionism, regionalism, this sense of globalization fatigue, and actually goes back to something, the, the, kind of the Washington consensus that, that open markets and greater integration was a good thing. I, I, did, I, think, it, I think it was. I think it certainly led to uh, the, the increase in, in global prosperity and, the, and addressing uh, the reduction in poverty. But there is a sense, certainly in this country and other places, of fatigue of globalization. It didn't work for everyone. Uh, and it's certainly the polls over the past 10 years in the U.S. shows that there has been uh, reducing support, lessening support for free trade and open markets. And we have to address what drives those concerns. And if you've been uh, a wage earner and you've seen your wages stagnant uh, and you've uh, lost your health care and you've been in an industry which has is, which is, uh, lost jobs to other places around the world, it's certainly, uh, it's certainly not unreasonable to be fatigued with a set of trends and phenomena which you see working against you and working against everyone you know. I was in Detroit two weeks ago, and it, uh, everyone should spend some time in Detroit these days. It is a sobering place to visit. And in some ways, it's a microcosm of this sense that globalization has failed the U.S., and, I, and there are other Detroits around the world that certainly feel the same. And let me just close by, by saying that in summation, the world is more dangerous. How much more dangerous because of this crisis? We don't really know. It was a dangerous world before the crisis. It's more dangerous now, teasing out the, the threads of, 
this financial crisis and impact on headlines we have yet to see a year or two or five down the road is quite difficult to do. But there, nonetheless, the world is a more dangerous place, and that has implications for military budgets. It has implications for the way in, we, way in which we conduct foreign affairs, the way in which we uh, treat our allies, the way in which we find new allies, and it's the way in which we think about institutional frameworks, whether it's NATO or the IMF. So again, it is, a, it, is a more, it is a poor world, it is a more vulnerable world, it is a more fragile world, it is a more dangerous world. And those are trends in which we can have outcomes that can have profound effects on the way in which we function. And again, as I go back to my first point, probably in ways we, in which we have not yet even begun to contemplate. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, Stephen. It was nice to have that introduction, also a bit of hyperbole. And thank you to Tim for his nice remarks. We were talking beforehand about how uh, we, we are actually members of different parties, but I think we're both radical centrists. <laughs> so um, why, uh, why have a discussion of the role of the G8 or what the G8 should be thinking or saying or strategizing about on global economic issues? I think it's very obvious that there uh, ought to be a discussion of strategic and military problems of nonproliferation at the G8, upcoming G8 summit. I don't think it's as obvious anymore because we have a G20 that there should be a discussion of global economic issues. I think there should be, uh, but I think that it is time for the G8 as a group, and in particular for the U.S. as still the single largest economic as well as military power, to bring some sense of direction and vision, not just for this G8 meeting, but to help the Canadians in thinking about the next G8 meeting uh, a year from now. And I think two messages that seem pertinent in this global economy are, first, we need much more focus and much more education and information for citizens of the G8 about how important a multilateral approach is. We need to strengthen the political support, uh, particularly for the IMF and the multilateral development banks, but also for the United Nations in certain roles like peacekeeping, which is related to economic security in so many countries around the world. Um, and second, we need to retain the role that the G8 began to assume now maybe 10 years ago in focusing on the problems of people who aren't represented, either at the G8 or the G20 meetings. And those include the people in the poorest countries, but I also would say the, the poor and the very fragile and vulnerable incipient middle class in many countries that we don't think of anymore as low income. I'm talking about outside sub-Saharan Africa, Peru, Mexico, Morocco, Egypt, I could go on and on, Thailand even. So those are my two issues, and they're, of course, interrelated, multilateralism, and what about the world's poor, particularly in the poorest countries, but also in middle-income countries. So I'd like to say a little bit about background and then resources, <laughs> and then reform of the IFIs. So on background, this is repeating a little bit of the points that Tim made, but I think it's very important to keep in mind that up, and up through 2007, for about 15 years, there was tremendous progress across the developing world, and I am going to be focusing on the developing world. I think that's what the organizers probably wanted me to do, uh, both in terms of economic growth and in terms of good policy and good government the fundamentals on macroeconomic policy, and also the fundamentals on having accountable, more representative, more democratic government. Uh, in Latin America, we saw for the first time ever, at least in, that I can remember or know, steady, not exciting economic growth, but steady economic growth for five, six, seven years. That really was making a difference, combined with much better policy in most countries much better policy setting. In sub-Saharan Africa, 
uh, average economic growth was 6 percent a year uh, since about 2002, and it was faster than that in the 23 democracies. There were three democracies in sub-Saharan Africa 15 or 20 years ago. Now there are 23. So we saw this great progress, and it was making a difference. Everyone knows that uh, poverty wasn't falling fast enough, but I've been looking at the sort of question of is there a new middle class emerging, and in many of these countries a new middle class has been emerging. Uh, not the terribly poor, but people at five to ten dollars a day per income, and they are, they are the potential bulwark of medium-term, sustainable, good politics and sensible economics. So the crisis is not just a crisis in arithmetic terms about people losing their uh, jobs and their income. It's also a crisis in sense of confidence about what works, and that's the, the risks of uh, the idea of um, capitalism being deep sixed, let's say, or of market, a market orientation and good government uh, being deep sixed. And we see that in the trade collapse around the world, which is dramatic, um, and dramatic in terms of lost jobs. We see it in the, the risks in remittances falling in many vulnerable countries, Central America in particular. And you know, remittances are clearly the most efficient form of transfer from rich world to poor world in terms of efficiency and helping people um, live better lives. But I think the biggest issue that is only now beginning to unfold at both the macro and micro level is the risk of huge fiscal shortfalls in many developing countries that cannot be made up quickly enough without a big multilateral push. Uh, in Africa already, <laughs> has lost over 1 percent of GDP equivalent just in trade taxes. So, you know, that means that countries can't run anything close to the stimulus packages or counter-cyclical policy. They don't have safety nets, many of them, and even if they did, they don't, wouldn't have the fiscal resources to implement them. And we're talking about very basic, the equivalent of food stamps just doesn't exist in most developing countries. There's nothing like the automatic stabilizers we have here, and nothing like the ability, because of deep financial markets, to borrow in order to use public resources to, to generate a stimulus. So the risks are, are very high. So what should be done? Let me say a word about resources, and then uh, in the spirit of multilateralism, reform of the IFIs. On the resources, I think the, the, uh, the Obama administration really did a great thing in going to the G20 summit in London and putting on the table, we have to have a major increase in the ability of the IMF to uh, transfer resources to help developing countries and emerging markets cope with the crisis. I put out a number one trillion in the fall at a time when it seemed you know, people said it's way too much. But in fact, it isn't too much. And in part because of the, the uh, endorsement and the push from the G20 summit, we're getting close to one trillion, uh, especially through um, the IMF. There ought to be a little bit more push on uh, what the U.S. Treasury staff call sweating the capital at the multilateral banks. That is more effective use of the capital there. Uh, there ought to be much more thinking now about replenishments, uh, particularly at the Asian Development Bank and possibly at the Inter-American Development Bank, because these banks, in trying to respond now to the, some of the needs of their big borrowers, are robbing the future, uh, particularly 2011 and maybe even latter part of 2010, in the, in the expectation that they'll have more headroom through capital replenishments. That's the sort of issue that I hope at the G8 summit will be addressed more clearly. And then, of course, there's the issue at the IMF of, of the gold and uh, the moving on and getting this gold sold and maximizing the amount of the 
subsequent resources that can be used for highly concessional, even grant transfers to the poorest countries. And that requires, you know, a, a push, especially in the U.S., because we need congressional uh, okay to do that. Uh, now, let me go to the, say a little, I, uh, one more word on bilateral aid. Uh, it's very difficult because Italy is in an embarrassing position, can't really take leadership as the host of the summit because it has taken a big, it has cut its own bilateral aid budget substantially. I think the U.S. is not in a great position either because we haven't seen any appointments in terms of who will take leadership uh, in the State Department on having a strategy for this third leg of our foreign policy stool, the three legs being defense, diplomacy, and development. But we really don't see yet what is the strategic direction uh, because we don't have the leadership um, yet at the State Department or outside the State Department on, on these issues. Leadership at the highest level with political heft is what I'd like to see. So the U.S., the biggest country, and Italy, the host country, are not in a great position. I'm a little concerned that there will be a restatement of the announcement, we will try to honor our aid commitments. I think that only breeds cynicism. I would urge, you know, restate the commitments for 2010, where there's a lot of vulnerability in developing countries, particularly amongst the poor. Uh, even if they're lower numbers, be clear and transparent so that the world and civil society and development advocates can monitor uh, that commitment. And I, I would search for some sec second leg on the aid side, an emphasis probably on transparency, on clarity about what these numbers are, and an emphasis on coordination and reform of the system, which is extraordinarily wasteful. Uh, so you know, I would applaud anything that comes, particularly from the U.S., on urging all of the uh, bilateral aid donors to push much harder on reducing the waste. An example, because the U.S., the White House is apparently talking about food security, is the fact that the U.S. is in the embarrassing position still of transferring, doing food aid primarily in kind. Um, that would be a great thing to bring to the G8 summit if the Obama administration could. Uh, it, it would be very tough because the Bush administration tried and got really kicked back on the Hill. But at least to start on some of those reform issues. Uh, if I have another minute, have I taken too long? So that was resources. Then in the spirit of multilateralism, I think the G8 uh, leaders could be more clear even than they were at the G20 summit on next steps in reform of the governance of the IMF and the World Bank. And I would look for a deal, uh, particularly between the U.S. and the Europeans, that says the U U.S. gives up its lock hold on uh, appointing the next president of the World Bank and ensures that there will be a system that de facto, as well as de jure, is open, transparent, and meritocratic without regard to nationality. Um, the U.S. should consider um, looking for a way to give up the crude form of veto it has at the IMF, where on major decisions 85 percent of the votes are needed and the U.S. has more than 15 percent. It could still retain a veto in, in the form. Actually, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, the managing director, mentioned this at a conference that um, the Center for Global Development co-sponsored with uh, SICE that perhaps there could be an arrangement where you could abstain. So if there were 85 percent of those voting, that would uh, be sufficient. I think some, some of these inside baseball ideas could be reframed uh, and put on the table in a way that would get us moving. In the case of Europe, Europe could work amongst the members with Italy's leadership possibly to reduce the uh, number of board members. Many of you will know that at the IMF, Europe has uh, one out of three, eight out of eight board, eight or nine? Eight of 24 board members. And both 
the Europeans and the U.S. could start thinking about, particularly for selection of the heads of the banks, having a double majority system, which the Europeans are familiar with, where there would need to be a majority of the weighted votes uh, in the traditional sense, but also a majority of countries. Uh, the latter would give small, low-income countries an opportunity to do coalition building and have some sense of influence um, in the way uh, these heads are selected, which in turn would make them more legitimate and more effective. Let me just end by saying in this, the G8 uh, probably has to say something, but it's clear there won't be much they can say politically about climate change. Given that we are the, – the, the costs of climate change in the developing world are already substantial, and it's absolutely terrifying uh, what the implications will be for my fragile middle class and the poor that would be associated with the amount of climate change implied even with what's on the table uh, in terms of legislation in this – in the U.S. So we are a long way from leadership in managing a problem that is going to be disastrous unfolding gradually over the next 10 or 20 years, not 80 years only, next 10 years for the world's poor. So back to where I started, we need a little bit more vision, a lot more vision as a sort of repeated agenda at this G8 meeting and s any subsequent G8 meetings if the club continues. Uh, and I would focus on generating more understanding of the need for multilateralism if we are to s retain the benefits of a globally integrated economy and continuing focus in the tradition started and enhanced, say, at Glen Eagles on the, set, the, the logic of the world's richest countries and most powerful, focusing on the problems of the world's poorest people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Versa. Executive Director Sadoon. Thank you, and I wanted to start by thanking the organizer of this uh, meeting. Um, my obvious qualification to be part of the panel are that I'm Italian. I'm a good friend uh, some of the panelists. And oh, yes, and I'm known for having uh, uh, eccentric views. Um, <laughs> that brings me to a very important point, a, a disclaimer. A disclaimer. Um, I formally have to disclaim that uh, the assessment of the views, the proposal that I'm going to, um, to present to you are not necessarily reflecting the views of the IMF or my authorities. As a matter of fact, I will go one step further and say they definitely <laughs> do not <laughs> represent uh, the view of my authorities. Um, mostly my eccentric uh, – somebody accused me uh, of uh, um, excessive pessimist views – are on the, the status and the prospect of the economy. But that is not uh, what uh, uh, I would like to make a remarks on. Um, my remarks will be on the institutional aspect of the global governance, and obviously the focus uh, will be on the IMF, to the extent that I know something about that, it's just the IMF. And then, but I also would like to uh, submit some kind of ideas on this, uh, some, of, some aspect of this uh, global governance. There have been a number, numerous victims uh, of this uh, global crisis, including among the victims uh, a number of very fashionable but uh, unsound notions, theories. Uh, these theories uh, pertaining to the alleged working of the global economy. You might, might not still remember the so-called new paradigm or, for instance, the notion of decoupling, uh, the fact that uh, the, the activities of the country, the economic uh, 
activities of the countries, uh, advanced countries, uh, could be decoupled by the emerging markets economies. And of course, uh, uh, amongst these discarded ideas, uh, there is also the idea, very fashionable, particularly in Washington until recently, of the total irrelevance of the IMF. Um, the, the reality is that uh, totally unrewarding, perhaps, uh, but the IMF has been trusted again at the center of the scene. And it's very interesting to uh, uh, evaluate it, how that happened and why that happened. You certainly follow on these uh, topics uh, the recent evolution, just to give you an idea how much the IMF is perceived to matter now. Uh, the financial resource of the institution has been tripled. Uh, the G20 summit uh, in London in early uh, April uh, decided uh, some way or the other to put at the disposal of the IMF uh, uh, one trillion dollar. One trillion dollar, it's a lot of money. The mandate uh, of the IMF uh, has been broadened to the areas which were not uh, the original core, including some kind of uh, coordination about uh, the reform of the rules uh, uh, of the financial markets. Uh, and w even on a, one of the core roles of the funds, which is, uh, is called surveillance, uh, uh, the funds have received uh, much tougher and much more ambitious uh, uh, responsibilities, uh, including the development uh, of uh, a so-called early warning system, which is supposed to anticipate and prevent the recurrence of crises, such as the one that we are going through. Uh, and just recently, just a few days ago, at the finance uh, uh, minister meeting of the G8 in Italy, um, the IMF has received the latest assignment, which is to develop so-called exit strategies, uh, namely the uh, policy which I suppose once we will be over this uh, acute phase of the crisis to steer the global economy towards a normal path. So clearly, you know, these are some but clear example of the fact that the IMF is back in business with the vengeance. Now, why that happened? Because after all, the so-called irrelevance of the IMF uh, was based uh, on some very clear uh, claims, very clear statements. Uh, they were saying that uh, the IMF uh, was lacking legitimacy, it was just uh, dominated by the advanced countries, it was not representative of uh, the, global, the, the international community, and certainly the role of the so-called emerging markets were not sufficiently represented. Uh, and also, it was claimed that uh, the governance structure of the IMF uh, was not uh, adequate uh, to allow the institution to discharge responsibility. And therefore, the conclusion was that uh, the organization was irrelevant, was peripheral, it was ineffective. Now, the reality is just proof that that was not so. So why? Well, logically, if you adopt a very French Cartesian logic, which is not my, my strength, uh, you could say that uh, either the allegations were not true or the allegations were correct, but they were irrelevant. But that is not my position. My position that in reality, some of the allegations were true. The conclusions were not sound. And the, what's happened? Two, basically two, two factors. One is that it's very surprising, particularly for a bureaucracy and an international bureaucracy at that, the IMF has been able to display a remarkable degree of adaptations, internal adaptations. Uh, didn't have to wait for political leadership or pressure to undertake a number of basic internal changes, which uh, 
mostly were not purely bureaucratic changes, but had an immediate and major impact on the way the funds is conducting its business. Uh, one of the things I just wanted to mention is that in the last uh, few months, uh, the IMF has adopt, adopted a total new array of lending kits. These are uh, financial facilities to support countries which need financial assistance. And they were not able, for whatever reason, or were not willing to uh, go to the funds for that assistance, for, for that type of assistance. So the funds internally decided to change that and uh, it's unfortunate that those facilities has been hugely successful. I'm saying this is unfortunate because it's a clear demonstration how much needed that type of uh, uh, financial assistance uh, is necessary. So one reason why the IMF has been able to go back to the center has been this internal ability uh, to change which, of course, as myself, as a member of the board, take absolutely no credit, but it is a fact. The second aspect, which perhaps is even more interesting in the context of our discussion, is that some of the allegations of the IMF lacking political legitimacy were true. But how did you find that? Well, by accident. What happened was that the G20 this is broader group, uh, which to a very large extent has superseded uh, the G8, had provided the institution with that type of political legitimacy, which allowed all these kind of things that I mentioned to you. It's inconceivable that an international organization receive one trillion dollar in resources without the type of political support and oversight that somebody, and in this case the G20, has provided. So that was not exactly what it was planned, but that is the reality what it happened. So my contention is that one of the basic reasons why the IMF is back in business at the center of the efforts by the international community to handle the crisis has been exactly this kind of political legitimacy that it has received. Now, G20 has done that. G20, as I just mentioned, to a very large extent, has superseded the traditional role of the G8. What's next? It's very difficult to go back. It's very difficult, for instance, to imagine that uh, even once the crisis is over, the countries that have been decided to get together in this grouping of G20 plus will decide that to eliminate themselves. Governments, bureaucracy usually do not commit suicide. So the notion, which could be an alternative path of gradually enlarging the G7, G8, G14, and something like that, that by and large, it's out of the question. Which of Attention, it doesn't mean that there is no role for the G8 or that there is no role for a G8 plus. They will continue to do, but it's in a different way and it's a different framework. In my personal opinion, there is a still very much a need for the G8 or even preferably a G7 as a kind of caucus, as a kind of group of homogeneous countries we share pretty much the same type of degree of economic development and a lot of both political and economic value. So there is, to my, my, my mind at least, the need for maintaining G8 in that type of role. As there is, again, in my mind, the need to use the, e, the notion of G8 plus, what in Europe, what we call variable geometry arrangement, which is an approach which has been used very effectively in, for many decades in the construction of the European community. The, the fact that depending on the issues we are discussing, the components of the membership of the group could vary very much. So if we discuss energy, there could be a certain number of G with certain representation, 
which might be different if we discuss other issues. Okay. So there is a role for that. But let's go back uh, to the IMF and the real, the governance of the global economy. Now, we are in the process uh, of uh, discussing with the objective of uh, reaching an agreement very soon uh, by, the, by uh, the beginning of uh, uh, 2011, we have to accomplish a major reform of the IMF. The reforms that the, the leaders of the G20 has indicated that they would like to see happen are a new redistribution of quotas. I presume you're familiar with the notion of the quotas within the IMF, which is the share of the capital that which determine the, 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 the role and the power uh, at the board uh, and at the other um, uh, organs of the IMF. So the reforms have to include that. Uh, the reforms uh, should include, most likely, some kind of slimming down of the chairs at the board, and has already been mentioned, perhaps uh, a reduction on the number of the chairs of the European countries in the board. And also, that is the final aspect, very important, that is also has to be some kind of reforms of the governing organs on the IMF. We are at the very beginning of this process, although the time frame is very tight, but we are at the very beginning of this process. And on this aspect of the uh, internal organs of the IMF, there has been uh, a number of proposals some of them have suggested the opportunity of uh, transforming what it is now a Council of Finance Minister, which is called IMC, which represent uh, the same countries which are represented at the board. This political oversight council right now has only advisory power, and because of that, the influence on the matters of the IMF are relatively limited. And as I say, one of the essential aspects of a prominent role of the IMF is exactly to maintain this very strong political legitimacy and oversight. So one proposal has been to transform the role of this advisory council of ministers into a decision-making body, which is a very interesting proposal because personally I don't think that the IMF could uh, continue to occupy that type of role without that type of political legitimacy and political oversight. Now, this kind of internal organ, in my opinion, goes in the right direction, but is not sufficient. And very pre briefly, without uh, getting into many details, I think so, that there are some merits to take this what council, as it's called, and not to utilize as one of the internal organs of the IMF, but to put this council of ministers above the IMF. And if you duplicate that, then you have one council which is the ultimate political uh, body uh, oversight IMF, the World Bank, and the Stability Financial Board. So you come very close to what is, for the first time, a truly, a truly global economic council. Now, somebody could ask, well, why that role has to be assigned to this type of council, and why cannot be taken by the G20, for example. Well, the problem, the G20 has a number of very serious problems. First of all, it's a, a selective group. By definition, any G is a selective group. The G20 is less selective than the G8, but it's still selective. A council, like the board of the IMF now, which is based not on the principle of one country, one membership, but the constituency has the huge advantage of being truly universal because every single country which is member of IMF, 185 countries, 
through this uh, um, structure of a constituency is represented at the board or at the council. Huge advantage. Second thing, the G20, is they are not really clear what are the criteria for selecting the individual countries which, uh, which are part of the G20. Because genetically you can say, yes, we have broadened up what was a club of the advanced countries and now there are emerging markets as well. But there are some countries which are not part of the G20 and probably they should. For example, Spain is not officially part of the G20. Uh, Argentina it is. So it's not only it's, the, the, it's a dishomogeneous group, but the criteria for membership in G20 are not uh, particularly rational in a certain sense. And there are other problems. The G20 has been very effective, both at the level of, uh, of minister and at the level of the head of government, but it's not a permanent body. I mean, they meet regularly, but that is not the same thing as so having a permanent body with uh, a permanent structure. And of course they could create a permanent structure, but why should they do that? They could find the type of permanent structure, both in terms of the secretariat or in the terms uh, of uh, a, 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 a research uh, a study department which the IMF and the World Bank already had. They already had that. So, you know, there are a lot of advantages. But anyway, regardless of what is going to be the structure, I can think that uh, with a lot of confidence I can make a projection that we will continue to discuss this issue for some time. Thank you. <laughs>
which fail to meet two of the three or four criteria that guarantee you have uh, stability. Uh, those criteria being legitimacy, ability to maintain physical security in your own territory, those sorts of things. Um, the center did a report that was co-chaired by several former con congressional members. Some people now in the White House were members and made this point that development is about prevention as well as managing the crisis. But obviously, in the case of the U.S., I have to repeat Pakistan. I mean, it's just a very good example where we didn't have a strategy uh, during the Bush administration, and now we have a tactic emerging from the Obama administration, which is we'll spend more money on economic development. But believe me, the amount of resources from the banks, including the World Bank, lost, wasted, feeding patronage and corruption on health and education in Pakistan since 1990 is very high. So you need not just the rhetoric, you need strategic thinking. Yes, thank you. Um, usually the last speaker has a hard time because all the good points have already been covered. Um, my perspective on the fragile style is somewhat different. Uh, of course, uh, there are fragile styles, as we mentioned, Pakistan, and so on and so forth. But I wanted to draw your attention to another dimension of this. If I may borrow a notion uh, uh, from a, a sociological point of view, there are the new poor as a result of this recession. There are new fragile states, countries, that you might not have considered that. And a lot of them are in Europe. A lot of them are so-called transitional uh, countries, which were doing very well up to the crisis. And now, exactly for the same reason that they were doing so well, they are suffering because those trends have been put into reverse. Uh, uh, mentioned the flow of capital, export, and something like that. So I just wanted to draw your attention that there is a huge swath of countries in Europe, in Eastern Europe, going from the Baltic to the Balkans. And those countries uh, are under tremendous pressures. They are financial economic pressures, and if the problems are not uh, handled in a proper way, I would not be surprised if there would be some very significant uh, repercussion even for domestic stability or for uh, um, security issues. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to turn it over to some questions. How about right in the front? Yes, my name is Nancy Alexander with the Heinrich Boll Foundation. Um, I believe that uh, yesterday when the um, uh, war supplemental passed with the IMF money. Uh, Chairman Barney Frank's uh, call uh, or legislation language on uh, having four billion dollars in proceeds from the gold sales for low-income countries was was also passed. And um, what's often not mentioned is when there's discussion of tripling the resources of the IMF is the fact that depending on how you count that tripling, only 2.5 to 5 percent of that amount is for low-income countries, of which there are 70 to 80 and growing. And so this is connected to the chairman's comment. Um, I'd like to know how important, if you think it is important, that uh, this four billion in proceeds for specifically low-income countries uh, be discussed at the G8 summit and there be a call for general agreement that this money should uh, be supported, these proceeds supported. And in relation to that, um, the IMF is widely viewed as having a significant bias towards contractionary policies, one reason for uh, some 50 members of the House, um, you know, raising questions about additional resources for the institution. And I wonder if you think that our concern about not only the contractionary bias of the IMF, but also 
the, the push on the IMF for exit strategies could exacerbate that, uh, that contractionary bias. Uh, I'd appreciate your comments on both those issues. Mr. Sadin, do you want to start off with the, the second part of that question? If I start, I'll never finish. Um, well, IMF traditionally was standing for is mostly fiscal. Unfortunately, it's no longer the case. That has been uh, uh, one aspect of the radical changes of the organization. As a matter of fact, uh, during this crisis, the IMF has taken the leadership for pushing advanced countries to expand uh, fiscal support measures. And they came to basically indicate that those, con those countries that are in a position to do so devoted 2% of GDP on fiscal measure, which uh, by at least some countries, major countries, it's a huge change. In this particular aspect, the IMF is uh, leading the rest of the international community in fiscal stimulus. That's the first observation I would say. The second observation is that uh, I would like to correct the impression that the IMF uh, is pushing perhaps prematurely for the exit strategy. We did not do that. Uh, <laughs> G20 and particularly G8 asked us to take a look at that. And among, among the exit strategy, there is also the need uh, to think about it, how we are going to absorb the excessive fiscal expansion, monetary expansion, that uh, is necessary to do that. But to say that the IMF uh, is following in this crisis its traditional policy of imposing heavy fiscal constraints which uh, could have the impact, at least in the short term, uh, to make uh, a bad situation worse, that I, I don't think uh, is, is not accurate. If anything, just the opposite. One last observation. This uh, uh, amount of money which was mentioned, the $4 billion, um, that should not give you the, uh, the idea that that is the amount of the resources that the IMF has put at the dispos at disposal of uh, emerging or low-income countries. Um, the IMF can use all of its resources uh, to assist uh, uh, countries that they need it. Uh, we are doing that. Um, until recently, there was some kind of very strong re re resistance, particularly from emerging countries, to use the financial resources of the, of the funds because they were afraid of the so-called stigma notion. The fact that the fact itself that going to the IMF was a bad indication of financial problems, something like that. And that's exactly the reason why we've changed our lending policies. And as I mentioned uh, before, with a considerable success, if there are more than a dozen countries, 15 countries, something like that, which have uh, availed themselves uh, with that type of facility. Thank you. Bravo on what uh, Dr. Sitting said. I would just argue again on the exit strategy. Getting the mix between fiscal and monetary policy, uh, getting it right internally is incredibly important, but coordinating across various other economic uh, actors is really important because if you think about central banks, I tend to think of central banks as either uh, in two camps, Stoics or Epicureans. And the ECB is a Stoic. They have a single mandate, which is price stability. We're Epicurean. We, we don't want to feel the pain. We have a dual mandate. How we make decisions between us on how quickly we reverse this monetary stimulus, whether it's raising rates or, or adjusting our balance sheets, has profound implications for capital sloshing back and forth, which means greater volatility in exchange rate markets, which has its own set of, of challenges. So coordinating the exit strategy, not advocating an exit strategy in the near term, but coordinating, advocating a coordination among the players and within countries between fiscal monetary policy, I think is, 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 is absolutely prudent and exactly what the IMF should be doing.
I think we have time for maybe two more questions. I'd like to take them at the same time in order to, 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 to save time since our panelists have been so gracious to stay over there. A lot of time here today. I could take the gentleman in the middle and then uh, the gentleman right there on, in the third row. Uh, okay, I'm Ira Strauss. I'm with the Committee on Eastern Europe and Russia and NATO, but that has nothing to do with economic questions. Um, I'd like to ask about the governance issues, and I would almost call it a new Washington consensus, which Nancy Birdsall represented, the media consensus, the rhetoric consensus that the West is in decline, and it needs to have its role reduced in these institutions. And uh, in a sense, it's a victory for the anti-G8 protesters over the years. The G8 has to go. Well, in a sense, what's being said is half gone. When I read the statistics coming out of the IMF, and I'm glad we have a representative here, I don't see that story borne out at all. And I'm afraid Mr. Strauss-Kuhn repeats the story, but I don't see that his statistics support him, and I'd like to ask about this. The statistics I see say the OECD, which is what the G7 really represents, is still 77% of the world economy, or 55% in PF, PPP terms. Uh, and I shouldn't say still because that's as much as it's ever been. When I last look at, at those statistics, when America was supposedly in decline in the 1980s and Germany and Japan were taking over the world, it was 60-something percent. Where's the decline? Where's the supposed economic reason for making all these changes? There can be other arguments, to be sure, justice or injustice. But if we have reasonably well-functioning institutions, more effective than the multipolar UN system, is it very wise to be undermining their functioning in the name of a reality that doesn't exist? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm Stephen Canna with the U.S. Council for International Business. And uh, going beyond the discussion of financial fixes and governance and regulatory reform, Looking down the pike, I think one of the speakers said that the, the GA could be a caucus. Well, to what extent is there any thinking about the need for a better global growth model once we get through this financial mess, namely that the rest of the world cannot be an export-led economy and the U.S. be a consumption import-led economy? How does one get global balances that really work? Do we need a new Keynes and White plan of something of this nature? Is there any thinking going on in the IMF? And where is the talk or thought in the G8 on an informal basis as to how we get these global balances to really work effectively? Tim, I know you've been thinking a lot about that second question. Do you want to start off on that and then we can perspective? Sure. I, I, I completely agree with you. I, I think if you look at the G20 discussion that occurred in Washington and in London, uh, and maybe even what's going to occur in Pittsburgh, there is not enough attention paid to what is going to be the engine of growth going forward because we cannot go back to the, to the, the trend of the past, pick whatever, pick the last 10 years, certainly the last five years, where the U.S. consumer is the consumer of last resort. The U.S. consumer is broke and is going to be broke for a long time. We are bankrupt, especially the bottom half of the country. And, and, and we, look, we lived beyond our means. We, and we did so because we had access to cheap and abundant credit. And now we have a wealth loss in the U.S. of close to $20 trillion, which affects consumption at the top of the pyramid. And we have uh, credit constraints at the bottom of the pyramid. And those at the bottom of the pyramid are also the first to be laid off and the last to be rehired. And if they were still uh, having a job, their wages are flat. The U.S. consumer is not going to drive growth going forward as it has, he or she has in the past expansion. In the rest of the world, some are starting to sober to that point. Not enough. And I agree with you, sir. We need to have a discussion about where growth is going to come from. And the surplus countries are going to have to spend more, consume more at home, and buy more of our goods. Or somewhere, somewhere else is going to have to take up the slack. And it's not obvious where that's going to occur. I don't know if you'd like to comment on that and also on whether the G7 or OECD can still represent the, the core group of the U.S. or the global economy. I know one thing that George Kennan has said is that, you know, I, I believe it was George Kennan, that the more people you add to a discussion, the, the exponentially harder it gets to reach a substantive agreement. So with that and your thoughts on the architecture going forward. I was hoping the team was uh, taking the question of over the presentation of uh, advanced countries and particularly European countries, and I was going to take the second one, but <laughs> feel free to address both. I agree. I'm, it's not clear to me that advanced countries 
are usually overrepresented. I do not agree that European countries are overrepresented. Just to give an example, if you go to the GDP, the United States will have the right to have something like 20, 22 percent share in the IMF, and they graciously agree to limit themselves to 17 percent. Now, of course, the fact that it's enough 15 percent to have a veto power has something to do with that, but that is something else. If you really go to see what is the weight of the European countries in the global economy, no matter how you measure, you come you do not come with the conclusion that, uh, that one third, 30 percent, 33 percent, uh, it's overrepresented. But we understand that there are other considerations, not purely economic considerations, and we are not opposed. I mean, as a, a representative of a European group of countries, we are not opposed of this kind of shift, but has to be put in the proper context. Now, the question that I really like it uh, is that the exit strategy. And I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I have to disappoint the gentleman because I cannot give you the answer. Of course, we do have the answer, but I cannot give you the answer because that is exactly what has just been commissioned to come up, and it would not be very smart. <laughs> the, the, the day after they ask us to look at that to say, here, we have the answer, regardless of whether or not the answer is a good or is bad. We have, you know, to valorize it any better. But one thing I can tell you, the growth model of the global economy after the crisis is exactly one of the topics that the IMF has been commissioned to think. Uh, we are developing something like that. Um, of course, uh, in order to come with uh, uh, the answer, you have to start, uh, it's not necessarily intellectually, but usually it's very useful to start with a very good notion of what's going to be the framework, what's going to be the economic environment that you wanted to address. And that is, again, it's not the official IMF forecast outlook. It's my own personal uh, uh, assessment and expectation. In one nutshell, if somebody asks me what is going to be the future of the global economy after the crisis, my answer is that it's going to be a bathtub, actually a Victorian bathtub. And the reason for that, you know, economists are found to give uh, a recession and recovery uh, a letter according to the shape of the profile of the, of the, uh, uh, of the development of, the, uh, of the, the economy. V shape, U shape, F shape, something like that. The shape that I like is exactly this Victorian bathtub because two, two, two factors. The slope of one side when you enter the recession, the decline, is very steep. When you get out of the, when we eventually will get out of the, of the recession, the slope of the recovery will be very, 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 very mild, very modest. But that's not at all. The other peculiarity of this peculiar shape of a Victorian bathtub is that the two sides of the bath, they are not equal. Meaning that even when we will be over this recession, not necessarily will go back to the same level that we had experienced before. And if you ask me what does the level represent, well, everything. It could represent the rate of growth, it could represent the level of wealth, it could represent a number of things. But the basic notion, the basic expectation that I have is that uh, the future of the global economy after the recession is going to be very different from what we experienced before. I don't think we could pick a better uh, uh, topic to end this on with coining a new phrase and a new term after all the talk about L-shape and W-shape recessions to a Victorian bathtub-shape recession. So I applaud you on your originality, and I hope you'll join me in thanking the panelists and welcoming Eric Peterson up for some final closing remarks on the conference.
Ladies and gentlemen, it falls on me simply to thank you for coming today. Um, I've been tasked originally with coming up with some cross-cutting observations. Let me simply offer very, very quickly uh, four. What strikes me is that as we watch this uh, G8 summit unfold, uh, we need to be thinking about a range of unknowns, of wild cards, many of which have been discussed here today, Iran, North Korea, future trajectories, including VTB, Victorian bathtub trajectories going forward. Uh, Senator Robb shared with us his uh, very considered view on the broader complexities that we face going forward, the urgency of the challenges that we face, whether on the proliferation and security side or the economic and finance side, were underlined by our, our participants one time after the next. And then what struck me as very significant were linkages with other processes. In the case of nuclear nonproliferation issues with the impending review, uh, we have the structures and procedures of the IMF, the World Bank Group, the broader regional development bank community. And finally, climate change was mentioned here, the linkages between global warming and, of course, the uh, upcoming Copenhagen meeting at the end of the year. We need to lace that in with the BRICS summit in Russia, bilateral talks that have occurred between India and Pakistan. Uh, we need to connect to the process, as Nancy Birdsall suggested, of those not represented uh, G2, G20, G whatever. Uh, the operative question is, what is the institutional base of proceeding? Um, so with those very telescoped thoughts, let me uh, thank once again the co-sponsors of this event, uh, first and foremost the Embassy of Italy, and then of course the Diplomatic Courier. Uh, on a roll, we've uh, been so delighted to work with you on this. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, my colleague, uh, Stephen Schwage, who has done an absolute great job in putting this together. He and a superbly capable team uh, have been a very significant uh, input in the success that this event has been. So I'd like to thank him and the CSIS folks and the other folks, the teams who have made all this possible, including, of course, the embassy and uh, the diplomatic courier. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.